Greetings and welcome to the 2021 Green Globe Awards, honoring the people, organizations, and businesses of King County that have demonstrated exceptional commitment to environmental stewardship. King County's most prestigious environmental award recognizes the visionaries, the innovators, the achievers who are leading the positive changes that build a better future for our region. We celebrate this year's winners in an exciting time for the environmental movement. After years of federal policies that created barriers for scientific research, environmental protection, and green innovation, we are now better positioned to create a more resilient, more sustainable, more equitable King County. The award winners we're about to see demonstrate how we can seize this opportunity, putting our corner of the country at the forefront of a green future. In the time since we celebrated the last Green Globe Awards, we've surpassed ambitious climate goals tripled our investments to protect open spaces, and outlined bold strategies that will produce better results sooner, from the Cascades to Puget Sound. Of course, none of our achievements would be possible without strong community leaders who spark innovation and inspire action. It is their contributions that we celebrate today. It's now my pleasure to introduce Christy True, Director of the King County Department of Natural Resources and Parks. Thank you, Executive Constantine, for participating once again and our highest honors for those individuals and organizations that have partnered with King County to protect, restore, and enhance our environment. I want to acknowledge that the environmental stewardship work we will learn about today is occurring on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish people, and we hope to honor them by affirming our steadfast commitment to continuing this important work. Our shared efforts to slow the spread of the coronavirus within the community led us to producing a virtual presentation of the 2021 Green Globe Awards. So even though we can't meet in person to say hello and thank each winner for their contributions, it is absolutely vital that we come together to recognize these accomplishments and the power of our partnerships. This year, we are recognizing 13 individuals and organizations that reflect the diversity of King County's residents and businesses, as well as its geography. From protecting and restoring irreplaceable salmon spawning habitat as it winds through the pastures of a dairy farm, to developing new methods for controlling stormwater from urban areas, from making affordable housing healthier for those who live there, to ensuring our comprehensive climate response plan has been informed by voices from all of our county's diverse communities and is representative of those communities. The 2021 King County Green Globe Award winners truly represent a wide array of interests and accomplishments that share the common thread of making this a better place to live, work, and play. trees that you see in here we planted. Yeah, in this park, uh, our work here, we had probably uh, five, uh, six partners. There were a bunch of trails that were private trails that were cut through that were for quads and motorbikes. So, and then with all the motorbike traffic and that, it just ripped off all the topsoil. I talked with the city and they said, hey, could you do the trail work for us? And we said, well, we have a contractor we work with that that's kind of what he does. And we have interns at Green River College who can help with the planting. You know, it's a way of, of building and being part of community. And uh, a coalition, we like to say, we build community one tree at a time. You know, King County is a very large organization, lots of people, uh, lots of resource, but there is no way we do this on our own. We really need our community partners and we need environmental leaders like Greg. It's really the people that know the communities, uh, that live and work within the communities. They are the keys to helping us be far more successful than we ever would be. Working on restoring and reconnecting people to the natural places around them is really how uh, you can long-term preserve those places and make sure that people 
uh, respect them for what they are and that kids can use them and uh, grow up being part of place. He helped uh, develop and fund the intern program at Green River College. Um, that program, 10 to 12 students every year, and they've been involved in over 20 restoration projects here in the Green Watershed. Education is vital. So if we can get students from colleges involved and uh, trained up and local citizens and volunteers, people can uh, actually take control of their own spaces and have a really significant influence. As Greg said, you build it and they will come, uh, evidence this park. It's interesting that as you uh, create natural spaces for people to interact with, they just thrive. You know, I think we all have a part to play in sort of climate proofing uh, our, our areas as much as we can, as fast as we can. With the coalition, we've worked on preserving thousands of acres of land. And I think that, um, you know, will leave a, a legacy. See you later. The community sometimes think that an architect creates standalone buildings. But in reality, I think that to become more effective, to be more than yourself, that you really need to learn how to plug into this whole bigger system. My profession has a lot to do with built environment, and the built environment plays a significant role in greenhouse gas emissions and energy consumption. We've nominated Gladys for the Leader in Green Building Award because she has had a commitment and has a passion for ensuring green building sustainable development is accessible to everyone in our community. Women and people of color and indigenous people are disproportionately impacted by climate change. The Environmental Education Research Center is a unique outdoor classroom and a living laboratory. We are striving to get an energy reduction of 50% with the renewable on the roof. The Othello Square Affordable Home Ownership Building. Our vision was to demonstrate that a project that is good for the well-being of the people can be good for the planet as well. Using non-toxic materials, we achieve a net energy use reduction of 45%. The White Center Community Project with 100% um, affordable family size units. In addition to the community building, we wanted to reduce the energy use by 50%. We also trying to get LEED certification for the community building and the salmon safe certification and also no fossil fuel use. At the end of the day, it would be about changing the status quo. We all need to move upstream to stop some of the root causes of inequity. So if we want change, we have to do something about it. When you think about forests, you really have to think about the long term. When it comes to the human lifetime, it's much shorter than the forest's lifetime. We help people practice ecological forestry on their land. Uh, ecological forestry is an approach to the forest that looks at it as a whole system. So not just for timber production, but also for all kinds of ecosystem services, wildlife habitat, carbon storage, recreation, even you know, spiritual solace. To manage the forest in that way, you have to understand everything that's going on in it, from the soil, through the, the understory, the trees, and where it's come from, and where you imagine it might go in the future. And we help people figure out how they can steward the land that they're looking after. And so we uh, urge people to consider systems of, of forest management where they grow trees to 
older ages where they introduce more variation in the forest by thinning the forest and create more heterogeneity or uh, diversity in the, the density of forest so that there can be patches with understory that sustains the um, berries and, and other understory plants that, that uh, wildlife enjoy. I appreciate the relationship that King County has had with Northwest Natural Resource Group. We've been working with them for several years, in particular working with NNRG on FSC certification, which is our sustainable forest certification on many of our working forest lands. They provide great and uniquely tailored advice for climate adaptation and forest carbon storage. And finally, they uh, have a really great relationship with smaller scale forest owners and providing forest management advice um, and consulting services for people who need guidance in how to make their forests healthier. Another project we're doing here with uh, King County is we're looking into uh, what will help this forest adapt to uh, the climate we expect in the future. As the climate warms, uh, we think that the sort of forest that can be supported by the climate of the 2050s and 60s will be different from the forest that's, that the climate has been able to support so far. NNRG doesn't own any land of its own. And so the work that we do is all realized through partners uh, whose land we're invited to work on. That's why when we work not just with King County, but also with all kinds of family forest owners, youth camps, church groups, land trusts, uh, Indian tribes who own forest, uh, that's one of the the areas of focus that we bring to it is how do we think about the forest for the future and for the next generation of stewards that will look after it. In 2009, our islands in the Pacific were devastated by a tsunami that left a lot of people homeless and without resources needing to survive. A group of indigenous trans women, Samoan trans women, Pacific Islander trans women here in uh, South King County got together and created a fundraiser. From there, we have discovered the power of coming together as a community, and we've started to take, in, uh, take on more work since then. You can see right behind me, we are at our vaccine clinic. Enjoy. Bye-bye. Take Bye -bye. care. Okay. Utopia Washington stands for the United Territories of Pacific Islanders Alliance. Uh, our mission is to create sacred spaces for the queer and transgender Pacific Islander community, also referred to as our cutie pie community. Utopia has really been a champion for climate equity, especially in the last few years. So the award they're receiving is the Climate Equity Awareness Award. Utopia has worked to expand its education with the Pacific Islander community um, to be able to keep them more aware of the, of the effects of climate change, not just in the South Pacific region, but also throughout the world. And so some of the ways that we have done so is by creating translated materials that are catered to the languages and the different cultures represented throughout the South Pacific. And although Utopia works on providing a lot of different social services, their expertise is really valuable in shaping climate policy. We need to be the ones that um, are in the ears of people who are making decisions and making sure that they hear um, how important this is to us. DIRCOR is a green job training program. We train folks to learn about uh, green stormwater infrastructure, restoration, so ecological restoration, urban forestry, um, and other types of green jobs as well. One of the things that we really focus on is, uh, is eliminating barriers. So there is no experience needed to join Dirt Corps. There is only really like a desire to learn about these programs and things. We also work uh, really hard to make it as bilingual as possible. So we always have a native Spanish speaker who is in a teaching position. We are working on, of course, other languages as well and, and working with our partner groups to make that a reality. Dirt Corps is a Green Globe winner because they are just such a 
catalyst for positive change. They have made such a commitment to creating a more diverse, inclusive, and equitable workforce. It's more than inclusion, you know, it, it kind of brings up a sense of belonging almost. I started out as a trainee in their training program and now I'm a project lead for all their green stormwater infrastructure projects. Working on a project on the ground, building it from start to finish just gives you that confidence <laughs> to, yeah, become a leader. This is the neighborhood of Georgetown. We have King County Airport. We are under the SeaTac Airport flight path. We have three or four train tracks running through the neighborhood. And that is our only access to the river. Um, right down at the end there is our only access to the Duwamish River. We've been able to do some maintenance on this road, um, and part of that maintenance is this conveyance swale here that captures a lot of the stormwater from the road and filters that stormwater before it sinks into the groundwater and then it goes into the river. A lot of partners on the project, but hopefully at the end of it, we're gonna have uh, not only a really beautiful park, but also an entire street that is gonna have green stormwater infrastructure and make it really functional for the community to walk down to this site. I think the important part of it is really just the access to the river, to walk somewhere that's just like concrete and dust. I think changing that and especially with the community involvement and having them come up and say this is what we want for our community. So people have agency over the environment that they live in um, and can actually have the, the skills and the knowledge and the capacity to improve that themselves. I think it's also a field of work that can be really restorative to the people themselves who are working on it. If people are interested in it, they, they should have the opportunity because I don't know what's more vital than um, getting in right relationship with the land. The hub stands for Hope, Unity, and Belonging, and it is a, an affordable housing development and a new community center for White Center. We plan on building 76 units of affordable housing, uh, ranging from studios to four bedroom units. And then we're also building about a 25,000 foot uh, community service center with healthcare, um, educational programming, family services, and it will be the headquarters of the White Center Community Development Association. The organizations that comprise of the White Center Community Hub are being awarded King County's Green Globe Leader in Green Affordable Housing. We're seeing a lot of gentrification and displacement pressure in areas like White Center. So this project is directly addressing that and specifically trying to create housing for um, immigrant and refugee families that have been displaced from other neighborhoods before. We want to make sure that they have a place in White Center to call home. For the last couple years, something that we've heard often from our residents is that we have wanted a, a place. Um, to do community building events and programming. As an organization, we have a commitment to, to advocating for affordable housing, um, making sure that our residents don't get displaced by some of the, the economic pressures that we're feeling uh, seeping our way. And this project embodies that vision and mission to, to grow the community without displacing the community. This could become a concept that continues to replicate to ensure that affordable housing, healthy affordable housing, is here for the people who need it most. I now wear this kind of community developer hat, um, but um, really at the end of the day, I'm a resident. I'm somebody who was grew up here, who was raised here, and I wanna make sure that this project embodies the spirit of White Center. Everybody should have an opportunity to live in a community where you feel like you belong. Harvest Against Hunger as an organization, our core work has traditionally been to get truckload size donations of produce into larger hunger relief organization partners. What King County Farmers Share allows us to do is to develop those connections of support between local hunger relief organizations and smaller scale farmers. I think that knowing that your food 
is getting into the hands and the kitchens of people that really need it, especially in your local community, is huge. Most small-scale farmers are doing it because they love it, and they don't just love to grow food, they love to feed people. Definitely great to see the growing enthusiasm from our partners. You know, it's more than just pounds, it's more than just calories, it's a part of earth, it's part of culture, and just bringing mo much more meaning and community behind food and where it comes from. To be able to get that to clients who are living paycheck to paycheck and you know can't afford that or are getting most of their food from food stamps or the food bank, to be able to supply them with that really high quality, fresh produce is, I mean, just beyond amazing. It's been an absolute pleasure partnering with Harvest Against Hunger to help develop the King County Farmer Share program. You know, there's very few programs that, that I have the opportunity to work with where we can kind of marry up different sides of the food system. It's the farmers benefit by getting revenue directly into their pockets by selling product into these markets. The food banks benefit by having the opportunity to purchase healthy, nutritious, locally grown food uh, to serve to their clients. And the food banks also have the choice of buying what they need, the types of products that they want that are culturally relevant to their clients. It's really just a win-win for, for everybody. And it's uh, the kind of program that we at the county are, are really proud to partner with and look forward to growing the program together in the future. I'd like to see this become kind of the normal way that hunger relief organizations across the board are getting produce and providing it to their clients. Because I think at the end of the day, what we're building with this program is healthier food systems. And that's important for everybody. My grandpa actually bought this place in 1936. My parents bought it from my grandfather in 1950. In 2000, I bought the place from my parents. We have an organic farm out in Enumclaw, Washington. I have a stream that runs through the middle of my farm. It's called Boise Creek. This little stream here is one of the most productive streams in King County. Spring Chinook, Fall Chinook, Steelhead, Coho, Chum Salmon, the occasional uh, sockeye, Bull Trout, and Cutthroat. When my dad moved here when he was uh, 14 years old, there were so many salmon in the creek that you could, you could literally walk across and not touch the water. Over the years, the numbers went down. Recently, within the last 20 years, we've seen the number of salmon come back up. We planted a bunch of trees with the idea of supplying shade for the salmon. Improving the riparian corridor here, planting native trees and shrubs. The county came in and cut some new channels into the creek gave the, the small fry a place to hide. Puget Sound orcas, they only want to eat uh, Chinook or King Salmon, and um, it's really critical that we're providing them with the opportunity to eat that food, and it starts right here. John Van Ruergen is uh, awarded the Green Globe Award, the badass organic dairy farmer. <laughs> I think that's the official title, isn't it, John? I hear the stories of my my father told me, and I want to be able to tell my grandkids the stories of, of the fish that were coming up this creek. It's very impressive to, to see two foot, 15 pound salmon swimming in your creek. It's cool. Do you actually need the drill or do you need the hole that it would provide? And uh, I think that's a pretty good testament to what the tool library embodies is you're not going to take that drill and put it on your mantle and use it as a decoration. Uh, so why not just borrow it and bring it back? A lot of the tools are just household level, but I'm really excited when I can connect with contractors and get those contractor grade tools uh, because they last a lot longer. You know, a lot of folks come for those irregular tools that you don't need all of the time. If you're making the decision to start a project and you have to buy materials and the tools, you're already behind. So if you can maybe 
remove the barrier of the tools, we can provide those to you for free. You can invest more in a higher quality uh, uh, consumable, so tile or, or wood trim or whatever the case is. A lot of us forget that the first step in waste diversion is repair or reuse and this, the South King Tool Library, really embodies those ideas and so it aligns with our work at the Solid Waste Division in trying to promote both repair and reuse. I would say the Fix-It program is probably one of the most important aspects of how we began as a tool library. It again harkens back to this idea of a conscious consumer where people are beginning to think like if something is broken, how can I not add to the landfill? How can I not have to go buy a new one? The average drill is used for less than 20 minutes in its whole life. So why would we need to each have a drill in our home? Uh, you know, come and use wires for 20 minutes and then let someone else use it. <laughs> we are extremely thankful to the Department of Ecology for Washington State for this opportunity. We could not have done any of our programming, anything without their support. Long-term goal really for the tool library is to be a replicable model where we can open a tool library in Puyallup or have annexes in different, por different places because direct service and accessibility are huge barriers for people that are on the margin. I just want to thank our community for being such a great support to us and we look forward to many more years of service to the South King County region and uh, hope to make everyone proud. Hi, I'm Sam Ferrazano with Equinox Studios down here in sunny West Georgetown. Equinox Studios is a complex of four different buildings with about 130 different artists and artisans and everything from painting, photography, glass, metalwork, woodwork, and ceramics, movies, music, two dance companies, two painting schools. Uh, if you can imagine it being made, it's probably being made here. We have a range of different interventions that we have created here known as green stormwater infrastructure. Stormwater pollution is the number one source of pollution to Puget Sound. By all these properties doing something on their sites to manage the rain as close to where it falls as possible, it keeps that rain from contributing to sewer overflows or turning into polluted runoff. Currently in the phase one is to pull a lot of the roof water and groundwater out of the storm sewer system. These are the technical things that we need to do, but we're this crazy cool community of artists with all these wacky ideas. At Equinox Studios, everything has to be creative, so we, uh, we take it to the next level. We're collecting roof water and having it be a sculpture where it's an active uh, waterfall basically down the front. And then we're gonna have a bicycle powered pump where people can pedal to pull that water up and irrigate the gardens. They've got rain gardens in a box, which are called gradixes, and they've got a living wall. What we call the Gardens of Gusto. And that was another one of our Georgetown Carnival projects. And now it is acting as a green wall, which actually helps pull the contaminants out of the air. They've got oyster barrels because oyster shells pick up a bunch of contaminants. And then actually I'm standing here on a kind of permeable asphalt and they also have permeable concrete and permeable pavers. So they have an array of things that help the rain soak into the ground rather than become polluted runoff. But we brought some Rainwise contractors here to learn how to build the Gradix systems. And a lot of the contractors were Vietnamese speakers or Chinese speakers and so inc like encouraging those contractors to learn these kind of new project types. So then they essentially could go out and be the contractor to build these projects for the, the businesses. The signage will allow business owners to see what they can do in really not using much space, not using much money. It doesn't need to be some ginormous effort. It's you can do little bits um, and be creative about it and do it in your own aesthetic. When the guys across the street see what we're doing, they might be interested when other folks around the city, um, the poor, Boeing, like, I hope that the effect of that is that more people are like, oh, we could do that.
Labatia is a Lachutzi word, and it literally means the transformer. Labatia Bridge Housing allows youth who are homeless to come into crisis housing and then receive rapid rehousing services. When I got here, uh, I pretty much had nothing. I had no job. I had no way of getting income. I had no way of getting a job. We work with the clients to obtain permanent housing and stability. I needed some way to feel confident and um, the gardening internship kind of gave me a way to do that. United Indians of All Tribes is receiving the Green Globe Award for Community Resilience. They applied and were awarded a grant to install a rain garden and a couple of cisterns and then also do community engagement with their youth residents. When I became the program director for Labatia years ago, I worked with some Native students and one of the things we came up with was having an organic garden because we do serve meals here for the youth. And then we also prepare a Native elders lunch here as well. So now we have garden all through the front, on the sides, and even in the back. For a number of years now, we have so much produce that every single year we're able to donate produce to the local uh, food banks. Weeding, turning soil, planting seeds, harvesting. We create like a little compost. We use that to keep the garden going. It just kind of maintains itself. It's, uh, I don't know, there's like life lessons in that. Communities know best what's going to work within their community. That's an important part of having a grant program is to get ideas, great ideas that come from the community. The community that you live in supports you, uh, but you also contribute to the community. In everything we've done here with the garden, with the waterworks program, um, it has to do with that. It's awesome to see anything you do grow. That's why I just feel like planting or just doing any sort of gardening in general is just really healthy. Now the Environmental Legacy Award. It goes to someone who has truly dedicated his life to improving the lives of others. Ron Sims, public service career in King County, is filled with forward-looking environmental stewardship accomplishments that strengthened our ability to preserve, restore, and enhance what we know is the wellspring of our region's livability. Ron thoughtfully expanded the county's parks and trail systems, including acquiring former railroad corridors that are now the East Lake Sammamish Trail and East Trail to serve fast-growing neighborhoods. His transfer of development rights program created a financial incentive for rural landowners to permanently keep their land undeveloped and shifted housing and growth into urban areas. The program preserved rural properties ranging in size from a few acres of farmland to the 90,000 acre Snoqualmie tree farm. He implemented the Critical Areas Ordinance environmental regulations, cited the Brightwater Treatment Plant, he advocated for a study on climate change in 1988, and he launched an equity and social justice initiative more than a dozen years ago. And the Green Globe Awards actually began under his watch. As a child, Ron's environmental journey started with exploring a pond near his home. Across from my home in Spokane, there was a small swampy area and I would go down there and pick up bugs and look at them. And so I was, uh, got very, very good at identifying bugs, what they would look like when they got older from larva uh, to a winged or a beetle. Um, and uh, so I spent a summer uh, with a young man, Frank Mangles, who was eccentric, really eccentric, in Eureka, Montana. And, uh, from that point on, I realized the importance of the environment. It was interesting, when the, both when I was the executive on the county council, I never lost the belief. And so I used to talk, we used to talk about how this region was going to grow. And my issue was the region was going to grow. There was a number of reasons. We had major companies moving in here. Uh, we had economic growth. 
and we didn't have policies that would guide us in a world of the future. And I used to say that, people would say, well, you know, the, the future is unpredictable. I said, no, it is not. We actually know what's going to happen in large areas of King County. And we have to go out and protect those areas first. So let's go out and buy forests. And people mock me for my uh, issues of protecting forests. And I said, no, they are the lungs. We need them. We need streams because we can't meet our obligations to the Native American community without having streams that can actually move salmon from one place back into Puget Sound and have them return. And so I said, and salmon need to eat and that is, and they eat bugs. And so I don't want to all of a sudden say, let's use pesticides on a wide uh, spread basis, because whether it was the county applying them or individual homeowners, that would have consequences too. So one thing led to another. But where I never lost Eureka, Montana, and I never lost my fascination with bugs and plants. And all of a sudden you had climate change and everything written about climate change change said it was going to alter everything that we knew about our environment and that would continue unabated and I realized all my life and probably most of the lives of my children that we were going to be in an environment that we had never seen. The idea was to have policies in place that were allowing us to move into that not quickly and smartly and to trust science and that was my key. You had to trust science. But the other thing was not to make these things formidable. We wanted people to be on the trails and to look at nature in real terms. And so we, I remember uh, talking to the railroad saying, has anybody bought your land? And they said, no, do you want to buy it? Because we don't want any liability. I went after those railroad lands. We had those, they, they were no, no longer in use, but they made effective trails. But we made sure they were in areas next to lakes next to streams and in forested areas and into ag areas. So we wanted people to realize the environmental diversity that this uh, county offered and why we wanted them to preserve it. And, I, and those were battles. I mean, none of these things were easy. It was not a, a kind period in my political career. I still, uh, sometimes when I look uh, from this viewpoint, uh, I both smile at it and sometimes you get a, you know, a little shock of pain over what it personally cost you, how it felt when you went home, how it felt when you went back to the council and then when it became county executive, how it felt then. The, um, and we didn't have a whole lot of support. The newspapers at that time were not sympathetic to climate change. And there was an article written by one of them who was uh, acute, said that uh, the client, that I'm talking about a lot of hot air because Ron Sims is a lot of hot air and I never forgot that and I have kept that uh, on my phone because I it was a difficult time. I didn't want to be anybody's champion and there was a person who I went to for counsel quite a bit. His name was Jim Ellis. So I look at Jim Ellis and I remember the last time we were together was on a waste treatment system the most sophisticated in the United States that would produce fresh water for the Puget Sound. It would be so clean and augment some of our streams. And I remember all of the tension I went through and the lawsuits and the name calling and the threats that I received, uh, the need for me to have uh, uh, double my security in order because of the number of threats that came in. But I'll never forget him standing here and saying, you know, it's never easy, but years from now, people will just accept this and its beauty and never know the fight. And he says, so that is the price that you're going to pay. You will know it, but it will be beautiful, won't it? And the water will be fresh, won't on it? And I said, yes, and he says, and then it was worth it. And I'll never forget him saying that, it's worth it. But more than anything, I receive encouragement from my family, particularly my father and mother who had the same issues in the civil rights movement where they were beat up all the time. And I remember when I got older, when I was doing part civil rights issues and my father saying to me, but you were born for this. And so all of a sudden I'm doing environmental work and people think, well, environmental work is painless. And by what you achieve is extraordinarily beautiful. The path there isn't always easy. But I don't regret one second of it. 
I made a promise to my sons that their children's lives would be better than mine. You know, my great-grandchildren, who I will not see, uh, one day maybe will be standing here and they'll look at the view. They will not remember who got this view, but they will certainly be happy that uh, their generation has it. Peace and prosperity to all of you. Great wishes. I saw the award. I told my wife, look at it. I remember this award. I remember this award. And uh, she said, how do you feel? I said, I won't cry in front of you. It was such a high price. It was worth every second of it. And I'm glad to receive the honor. And I'm glad of those who considered who should have it and made a decision that I was worthy of the award. I want to thank them. It's my pleasure to announce the winner of the highest honor of the 2021 Green Globe Awards, the Environmental Catalyst, which goes to the Climate Equity Community Task Force. As we began to develop the 2020 Strategic Climate Action Plan, we created an entire new section focused on climate justice, driven by frontline communities disproportionately impacted by climate change. We brought together 22 leaders representing BIPOC communities, immigrants, refugees, people who are experiencing disproportionate exposure to pollution, to elevate their expertise, to create community-driven solutions. They strengthened our strategic plan, connecting our climate action to other goals, like affordable housing and green jobs and food security. Thanks to their contributions, we have a clear path to creating a more just, more equitable future in a changing climate. I invite you to watch their story. With the wildfire smoke seasons we've had, we've really seen that you can't hide from some of these things. Not everyone's gonna be impacted the same way. And we've definitely seen that with the COVID-19 crisis. Some folks are, are impacted way more than others. How we adapt to climate change and how we invest our resources is critical because we don't wanna end up with a class of folks that were able to adapt and those that don't. We're not necessarily the people um, that are creating these large greenhouse gas issues, but we're the people that are facing the impacts of droughts and things like that. For me, I'm a member of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, and a lot of our traditions are steeped in our relationships to place. And with places changing, that's putting at risk um, some of the ways that we have um, cultural connections, but also economic well-being. Which communities have more tree canopy? Um, we know that South King County has less tree canopy. Uh, I live in a community that has an abundance of tree canopy and has about nine parks that I can walk to. So you can definitely tell the difference in what communities have been um, historically neglected. The Climate Equity Community Task Force is a group of 22 community leaders um, who are primarily BIPOC folks. This group has been shaping the new climate justice framework that is included in the 2020 Strategic Climate Action Plan. This is actually the first climate justice framework that the county has ever had. And when you look across the country, there's only a handful of jurisdictions that have taken that on. And so this is really groundbreaking. This includes people from all around the world who are bringing all this expertise, who otherwise might not be included in the climate science discussions. There's great work happening with the local food initiative around getting more access to more land for immigrant and refugee farmers. And there's now um, a food access and food security section. That was an issue that wasn't addressed in the previous plans. There's now a new green jobs section. Expecting that as part of a five-year plan, this framework will continue to grow and expand. And this is just a starting point. I think it's gonna be ongoing work. I have a 13-year-old daughter and I really care about her future and other children's futures. And I would love for our young people to know a more healthy environment, continue having the Pacific Northwest be the kind of vibrant communities that we all have come to know and love. Congratulations to all of this year's award winners for their inspiring success. I want to thank everyone who made this year's celebration possible, including King County TV, 
and the 1,800 dedicated professionals at our Department of Natural Resources and Parks. Thank you for watching. I invite you to join me in 2023 when we celebrate the next Green Globe Award winners. Thank you.